a trio of headlines headline today's show. Well, let's make that a quattro because number one is Fridays are awesome. I'm Carl Azus. It's great to have you spending part of your Friday with us. We start in Central America, where people are trying to recover from Hurricane Iota. It struck Nicaragua's Caribbean coast as a Category 4 storm this week, about two weeks after the Category 4 Hurricane Ada made landfall there. When it blew ashore, Iota's sustained wind speeds were 155 miles per hour, just two miles per hour shy of Category 5 status, the strongest hurricane classification. IOTA killed at least 26 people across Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and Colombia. And though its wind speeds have died down, IOTA's rain still threatened to bring flash flooding, river flooding, and mudslides to Central America. Officials say the storm affected more than 400,000 people in Nicaragua alone. In the United States, students watching this show from New York City are likely watching from home. The nation's largest public school system was one of the first to resume in-person learning this fall, but less than eight weeks afterward, the number of new coronavirus cases reached a level that triggered another school shutdown in New York City. State officials are expected to close gyms and indoor restaurants there in the days ahead. The pandemic has also had a major impact on the airline industry, but the aerospace company Boeing just found out its 737 MAX planes are back on track to fly in America. The 737 MAX is Boeing's best-selling jet, but U.S. regulators grounded the model in March of 2019 after computer problems caused two of the planes to crash, killing 356 people. Boeing has updated the plane's software and made other changes. The federal government says after additional safety measures are taken, the planes will be able to resume some domestic flights in America. But U.S. airlines allow travelers to change their plane if they still don't want to fly on a 737 MAX. Next story today focuses on the U.S. executive branch. President Donald Trump says he still has a clear path to victory as his campaign disputes election results in several states. But states are moving toward certifying their vote totals, and American media project that Joe Biden is the U.S. president-elect. He hasn't announced his nominees yet for important cabinet jobs, but CNN 10 contributor Kelly Mena explores what those positions are all about. Kelly. Thanks, Carl. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the presidential cabinet, a group of individuals who advise the president. The presidential cabinet is made up of 15 executive departments, including the vice president each with a head known as a secretary, like the Secretary of Transportation or the Secretary of Education, with the exception of the Justice Department, which is known as the Attorney General. Cabinet members are chosen by the President and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. The Cabinet members' departments are important to the running of the country, and each secretary will advise the President based on their area of expertise. The presidential cabinet dates back to the first president, George Washington, who had a group of four trusted advisors, including Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. These advisors are usually nominated around December and January, and the full cabinet won't be confirmed until a few months into the new administration. In recent presidencies, at least one chosen cabinet member will be withdrawn before being confirmed. Carl. Though President-elect Joe Biden has started to fill out portions of his cabinet, it will be interesting to see the final lineup of chosen advisors. 10 second trivia. The substance algin, which is used to make everything from candy to car tires, is found in what? Milk, petroleum, bamboo, or kelp? Brown algae, AKA kelp, is a major source of algin. Though the uses for brown seaweed are expanding worldwide, the kelp farming industry is not a big one. And some scientists say farms need to be monitored as they grow because on a large scale, they could affect and possibly harm the local marine environment, and they could harm communities that become dependent on growing kelp if the crop were to become diseased, for example. These pros and cons are mirrored in using kelp or seaweed as a food source. It contains a lot of nutrients and a lot of minerals. But some researchers are concerned that eating too much of it, especially on a regular basis, could give people too much iodine, which can cause health problems of its own. So farming kelp is not an answer to all the world's problems, though those who do it count many benefits. This is Rathlin Island. It's the northernmost point of Northern Ireland, has a population of around 150 people, and is the site of one of the UK's few kelp farms. 
And this is Kate Burns, who founded Islander Rathlin Kelp after visiting kelp farms in Maine, USA. I just thought there were scientists doing something in a lab with seaweed. Uh, so it wasn't until I think I saw it as a food product. And then also the working with fishermen. It was the working with fishermen thing that re really clicked with me. Kelp is something of a wonder crop. It absorbs large amounts of CO2. Actually good for the environment when you grow it. No fertilizers, no pesticides, herbicides. It's nutritious. Kelp and other seaweeds have as much protein gram by gram as beef and are one of the few non-animal sources of vitamin B12. On top of all that, growing it creates beneficial ecosystems for marine life. To produce a food with, with such food value, it's surprising how much chefs and how much people talk about seaweed and seaweed the new food, but actually when you look for it in menus and when you look for it in shops, it's still not there. The United Nations stated that seaweeds like kelp have unmatched potential in tackling global issues such as food insecurity and climate change. But growing them is not easy. Firstly, the conditions need to be right. Kelp likes to grow between 7 degrees and 12 degrees is ideal. But because of the Gulf Stream, we have sea temperatures here generally between 7 and 12, 12 months of the year. Kelp is not actually a plant, but an algae. So baby kelp, or spores, have to be collected and grown to seed the kelp lines. So this is the lab, stroke nursery. And this is where we do the cultivation in here uh, of, the young, of the young kelp plants. And these have been growing for about 35 days. And the kelp plant is about two millimeters long. Millions of kelp plants, and those are ready to go out to sea. Kelp is amongst the fastest growing organisms on Earth. Some species can grow upwards of two feet per day. So we would grow our kelp lines usually about 100 meters. So you're talking about a ton of kelp coming off that. Um, and so we maybe would have somewhere between 15 and 20 ropes out. Although seaweed has been growing throughout history, the industry today is still fledgling, but growing rapidly, doubling in size between 2005 and 2015. And it currently produces over 30 million tons a year. But Burns thinks there are thousands of potential farmers in struggling fishing villages who could help expand the industry. I mean, I think what's really important is that we as a small community here have have done something amazing and we've, we've proved it could work under the most challenging circumstances um, and really with very little resources. But we've created jobs and you know we've created an industry. It needs to take off. It's such an important food stuff, such a sustainable food stuff and such a, such a useful resource for, for coastal communities. In New York City tradition, a 75-foot-tall Christmas tree recently arrived at Rockefeller Center. What's not traditional is what was inside. This guy. A worker found him while setting up the tree. Officials say the saw-wet owl probably got trapped when the tree was being tied up for transport. They named him Rockefeller. He's not seriously hurt. And after Rockefeller fully recovers at a wildlife center, he'll be set free. Say what? No, saw wet. Saw what? A saw wet owl. Who saw it? I saw it. Soon he'll be a free bird. This winter he'll be a snowbird. He's been involved in quite a flap and we don't know if he'll be beak, but we are glad folks were on hand to help a feller like Rockefeller. I'm Coral Azus. Today's shout out goes somewhere new, like New Brockton High School. It's in New Brockton, Alabama. Great to have you guys on our YouTube channel. We will be back next Monday and Tuesday before we're off the rest of the week for the Thanksgiving holiday. So CNN 10 will be CNN you then.